Good News Productions International presents Venture in Faith. Inspiring testimonies from Christians of all ages, telling how God has worked in their lives. It is both interesting and significant that the central piece of furniture in the tabernacle is called the Ark of the Testimony. It had three major things inside of it. It had the tables of the testimony written by the finger of God. It had a golden pot of manna, and it had Aaron's rod that budded, blossomed, and bore almonds in a single night. You could never see those things. The only way you knew they were real was by someone's testimony who had seen them. God even then was teaching us about the power of testimony. Today, every Christian can enter into the holiest and experience God, but sometimes we find out about the reality of God by means of testimony. We're delighted today to have Steve Saint and his two friends from the jungles of Ecuador, uh, Mincaye and Tamenta. And some of you will remember that Steve's father was a martyr who died in 1956. And uh, the man seated right by Steve's side is one of the men who killed his father. Steve, I'm going to ask that you begin uh, this testimony by reading a letter you recently received. Boys, this is a letter I received from somebody that I've never met. Um, somebody checked out our website and um, wrote me, Dear Sir, I was outraged at your seeming indifference to the Waurani culture upon visiting your webpage. How could anyone possibly have the evil within them to desecrate a culture older than your religion? She says, The idea of trying to convert these people to your system of beliefs is simply appalling. Rachel Saint, that's my dad's sister who went back in to live with the people, she says, Rachel Saint had no business converting Dayuma and building a, and in quotes, better life for the Waurani people. It is through intervention of Kawudi, which is the Waurani word for foreigner, it is through intervention of Kawudi like you that these peaceful people have come to know poverty, sadness, and anger. Is it because of jealousy, she writes, that you have chosen to destroy their lives? Is it unfair that there are some people that have richer souls than you without believing in God? Nate Saint's death, that's my dad, was tragic indeed, but he died from ignorance. Had he realized that these people did not need the, and then in quotes again, the love of God, perhaps he may have remained with us a little longer. And then she goes on, I beg you and your fellow missionaries, leave these people alone. Spreading the word of God should be concentrated on those who need it and want it. Believe me, these people will live without your help much as they have for the last millennia. The Amazon is the Eden that you have searched so hard to find. Have you really learned anything from the Bible? Learn to let go and back away. And then she closes, keep the garden free. She's never been to the Ecuador, Ecuador to the to the rainforest. No, no. And now, in a minute, I'm going to have Minkaya tell us about the old way of life. But it was a very violent society, wasn't it, Steve? Extremely. Um, in fact, um, a number of anthropologists have studied the Waurani culture precisely for that uh, reason that it was the most violent society that um, has ever been studied on the face of the earth, as far as I know. And uh, you said that 60% of the people inside of that tribal group died from homicide? That's what, um, that's statistics that came from uh, three anthropologists, one a Christian anthropologist and two secular anthropologists, yes. They said that more than 60% of all the people, men, women, and children, died as a result of um, homicide within, within their own people. Within, and there were others killed by outsiders, but yes. we're talking about Family members killing family members. Yes, within the same tribe. Within the same tribe. Now, why don't you uh, let us, uh, you translate from Minkai and have him tell us firsthand about the old way before the gospel came. Okay. Minkai, Vito, Weringi, Tiribi, O Bois, Tirika, Kinante, Durani, Weninere, Kinante, Kiwin andapa, o Waemu, 
or Wene Wene Kekandapa, or Kiwangandapa? Wene. Wene? Mm. I yeah. said, did Boyce wants to know, how did, the, how did the ancient ones, how did the people before, how did they live? Did they live clean and well, or did they live badly, badly? He says, Wene. That's the word for sickness, that's the word for evil spirit, that's the word for bad. Are you? He said a long time ago, the ancient ones, they tell us, lived well within their tribe, but then something happened. Want that? He said, then somebody was bitten by a snake and, uh, and somebody felt that it was evil spirit work, that uh, somebody had cast a spell and, and that started the problems. He said, then people just started um, spearing and spearing. We lived up by the Toroboro, which is the Napo River, the northern boundary of their territory now. And he said, people just started, Tanonani is, is the word for spearing. They just started spearing back and forth. I think what he said is, is that just like we kill monkeys now for food, that's how we were killing each other, living angry and hating, uh, we were spearing. He said, and not only did we kill ourselves amongst ourselves, but we also killed foreigners, and foreigners also killed us. Naime, kino naime. Peleando. Ah, oh, naime, yeah, fighting, fighting. Want that the new idea? How about now? No, money can. Money, wait, damn, I mean, petty, no. I'm going to get down, but I'm not giving any that. Giving any money, but wait, the naime, I'm telling you. Oh, he said then, Muipa, he's still back in the old days. He said then, Muipa, he's naming one of the um, members of the tribe that was killing lots of people. He said then, then Muipa started killing everybody. He said, when I was a little boy, we just lived eating pitomo, eating seeds. Um, the connotation is we couldn't even grow gardens because we were just fleeing all the time. He's, he's showing how many people he killed, but he, he was killing people you know, not just one at a time, he was killing lots of people. Tell me, Mwini. Want that the kino new idea? New, Imanaga. How about now? New, Yamu, King Munidi. King in the Dabu, but the King Munidi. Then come and go in the Mengota. What it? He said, Now we don't live that way because Mankamo, one of the women in the tribe, um, the woman who is married who is the wife of Gikita, the man who mm -hmm. led the, the spearing raid when my father was killed, he said uh, she just got tired of all the killing and she said, I'm going to go and let the foreigners kill me. Okay, 
<laughs> the Wawrani can tell a story in any sequence and they can live out, leave out pieces because when they come back, you know, they don't tell a story once, they tell it over and over and over and they can tell the last part first, the first part last. He, he said that Mankamo went out and he's not saying, but she went with another aunt of his, Mintaka. They went out to the outside because Mankamo's baby had died and she just said, it's enough. Uh, everything is just dying. We're all killing each other. Now her baby died of sickness, but uh, I think she suspected sorcery again, and um, so she decided to go let the foreigners kill her. So she went outside, but she wasn't killed, and then he skipped that whole part and is saying, then she came back in. One, one year later, or one season later, she came back in, and Kimo, one of the other men, he said, didn't you hear? Minkai, that the foreigners didn't kill Mankamo and she's coming back in. I say tomorrow, Duk, let's just go on the trail quickly, quickly, let's go and see what she has to tell us about the outside world. And they brought Dayuma with them. Dayuma was a young girl who had fled from the tribe when she was a teenager and they had been reunited with her and they had heard that she had come back too. Mm. He said, when Dayuma came in, Dayuma said, Are you really Minkai? My uncle, are you really Kimo? And she said, People, I say to you, are you still living in the old way, still angry and hating and afraid? Are you killing each other? And she said, Don't you know now I have heard Wang Lungi's carvings, or I've, I've heard God's talk, and I've, I've seen his carvings, and now I've seen that he has a trail where people live not killing and living angry and hating each other. And Dayuma started saying, the man maker, the one who created us, the creator, he doesn't want us to live this way. He says that living in peace and not hating each other, that's how we should live. And then Dayuma had told them all she knew and they still wanted to know more. So she said, people, if you see it well, I'll go tell Star to come in. That's what they called my Aunt Rachel, who when my dad was killed, she was actually studying the Wow language with Dayuma. And Dayuma said, if you see it well, I'll tell Star to come in. She can actually, she can actually read God's carvings on Mikayunta, on thin bark. And she said, if you see it well, I'll tell her to come in and she can teach us to walk God's trail. Now, wh why don't you have Tamenta tell us uh, how uh, his story, because his father was the only real Waodani that your father knew. Right. And uh, tell us about his death and the nearest, uh, the uh, escape from death that uh, Tamenta had. Boys, when, um, when Dad and the other fellows were killed, um, they were all working down in the eastern Amazon jungles with different tribal groups and my dad um, was their life link, uh, hauling missionaries in, hauling supplies in, flying Indians that these other missionaries were working with out when they were sick to a, a mission hospital. And, um, uh, but all of them knew that there was one group of people, everybody called them by a derogatory term that I usually don't use, but um, it was auka. It meant, in the Quechua language, it meant naked ones or savages, and the connotation was really, was really bad. Um, and those people had never had a friendly contact with the outside world, with Indians or, or, or national Ecuadorians or anybody on the outside, because they, not only did they kill amongst themselves, each 
group within the group and then the two, the upriver group and the downriver group killing back and forth, but they also killed anybody that came into their, uh, into their territory across their borders, and outsiders also killed them whenever they got a chance. So it, it really was a violent way of life. And they were almost annihilated. They were down to, when Dad was killed, as well as we can tell, they were down to about 500 people. It was down to the point where it was really hard for um, young men to find uh, women that they could marry that were properly related to them because they were supposed to marry cross cousins. Um, and when they didn't have a cross cousin to marry, then the only other opportunity they had was to go and kill you know, a family in another clan and steal a wife which was seen as being immoral. And uh, the reason it was immoral is that their children would now have enemies on both sides, so their chances of survival were almost nil. Their father's enemies would want to kill them and their mother's enemies would want to kill them. So, um, I mean, it was really a desperate situation. And what people don't seem to understand is they didn't like living that way, but they didn't have really any mechanism to stop it. There was no authority structure. They were extremely egalitarian. Everybody just did whatever they liked. You know, people up here in the States talk about wanting to maximize freedom. Well, if you really take freedom to its, to its maximum, that's how they lived. Everybody got to do just exactly what they wanted, but that meant that other people had that total freedom and um, the killing was rampant. At any rate, Dad and uh, his friends knew that the Shell Oil Company had been moving into the Waurani or the Auka territory, but they call themselves Waurani. And every time their employees would cross the boundaries into Wau territory, if the Wau found them, they would spear them. And it was getting hard for the oil company to get employees. They were putting pressure on the government to um, uh, deal with the problem. And you know how governments deal with problems like that. So they decided that they needed to make a friendly contact if they could. In the process of making that friendly contact, they dropped gifts to the people from an airplane, dad flying, um, on a long line because they knew that they needed to show the people that this wasn't an accident, that they were really trying to give them the gifts. And the people recognized it. After, oh, two or three tries, the people started taking the gifts like machetes and axes and aluminum pots, things that they knew were valuable to them because they would go out and kill outside people. I mean, they, sometimes they'd kill a whole family just to steal one axe. So they were giving them those things and the people started putting things that were valuable to them back on. Um, pets, like a parrot that I had for a pet, um, smoked monkey um, pots, things like that, that were from their culture, they were exchanging those gifts. And then finally, Dad found two rivers over from where the uh, village was that they'd been doing the gift drops at. He found a, a sandbar in the river um, that he could land, just barely land a plane on. He landed there, he took the other four fellows and they set up base and then they waited, hoping that the uh, Waurani would find them. And uh, after they'd been there waiting on the sandbar for three days, uh, three Waurani showed up. They uh, heard somebody call from across the river in the jungle. The men all looked over and three people walked out of the jungle, one man and two women. Now that man was Tamantha's father. They came across the river and uh, spent the day with them. Dad had a 16 millimeter movie camera, so different ones of them took uh, videos of the fellows there on the beach in this first ever contact with these people. Everybody, the five missionaries and the uh, three Waurani all seemed very much at ease. Dad even took uh, the man they called George, whose real name was Nankiwi. They took him for a ride in the airplane. When they came back, he wasn't satisfied. He still wanted to be in the airplane. Uh, Dad took him because he climbed into the airplane, wouldn't get out. So finally, Dad took him on a second ride over his village, thinking that must be what he wants. and. Uh, that was what he wanted. In fact, he actually started climbing out the door onto the strut to be sure that the people could see him. And Dad wrote in his journal that he didn't know what to do. You know, he was, just, he was afraid that he'd fall, but when he reached over to grab him, the only thing that there was to grab was his G-string. So he decided, well, maybe that wouldn't be the best thing. So I, I don't know. But um, uh, then they left, and the next day nobody came. And then the next day, they were really anticipating a friendly contact with the whole village. 
but instead they came back um, to spear them. It had to do with internal things happening in the tribe, and I've written um, a chapter in a book about that. That. Uh, but Dementia's father was really a lot to blame for that, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He was the precipitating cause. Um, he was doing some things that weren't seen well by other people. Um, and they actually killed him. Well, after they killed my dad, then a uh, number of months later, within the next year, they speared him, and uh, and uh, laid an ambush outside of his house. And when he came out during the night, they speared him. He ran off, and the next day, when they went to finish him off. Um, he just said, you know, don't spear me anymore. Let me die like a real person. He wanted to be buried alive. So they let him make his way back to the village. They broke off the spears that were still in him and uh, had his sisters dig him a hole, and then he climbed into the hole. But before they covered it over, he said, I want my children to die with me, which was not unusual in their custom. And so his wife, you can imagine how she felt. She was losing her her husband, and uh, then he wanted her to, to give him the children too. So she took her three or four year old daughter and uh, not wanting her to be down in the hole and, and suffer because it was a slow, agonizing death, uh, suffocating and her father moaning and bleeding and all that. So instead of just putting her in the hole, she strangled her with her own hands, which I mean, I've seen chicken strangled, and it's a gruesome sight. Can you imagine doing that to your own baby? And the Waodani love their children. And then she put her down in the hole with her husband, and then he said, I want my son too. And she was just going to do the same with him, and then she thought better of it and grabbed him and ran off into the jungles saying, you know, if I kill him too, then when you're dead and I'm old, who's going to bring me nourishment? You know, who's going to bring Hunt me food? Me. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was that was Tementa. Now he has grown up to be. He's one of the lead elders in the wild. He's a he's a, and and we're talking about a culture that a lot of people talk about the noble savage. And this lady writes you and says, "Leave these people alone. They're living a peaceful life." But here's a boy whose sister was strangled by his own mother. His father was speared by uh, members of the same tribe. The people themselves say that they they oftentimes now it wasn't that they didn't have any fun. I mean, you know, they just they lived with the reality of death and dying all the time. Um, Minkai says they were either they were either afraid or they were pinte. They were angry. Um, um, that's how they lived. Shakespeare said the clock upbraids me. Well, I I'm going to fast forward a little bit and. Uh, Tementa helped your Aunt Rachel translate the Bible into their own language. They call it right. God's Carvings. God's Carvings. And I'm going to ask uh, that Tementa read from God's Carvings, and it will give our viewers an idea of the, the different expressions, the different way of expressing truth. Tementa bito wengi di wemoni weringi akimi. Who? Oh, Tementa eninga. Ire wengung in ten poga, givenani naniti, ni warete ponenga inte, tomenga wenga, arukanki o inenga inungante pononga, ponga kaimba. Ininki a cano tominga inante, ni were ponena inumu, tomenga, wen wumuna mainte, kuin, wena mai, givenke kaimba. Oboto inglés de bero. Do you want me to yes. read that back in English? Yes, if you would. Now, I'm going to read it back um, in English, but I'm going to read it in their culture. I'm going to, I'm going to translate it literally. literally. Okay. So, you, so you can see why just taking our Bible and translating it literally into their language would not communicate. Um, this is the way it reads. Then the man maker, or Wang Lungi, the creator, then the creator to the dirt, people living there, um, in his thinking, seeing them well, his child, only child, the son, sending him, he came. Whoever now, um, the Creator's son, seeing him well in his thinking, that person not being lost and always not dying will live. That's John 3.16. Now the man seated to your left killed your father, and your son, you have four children. Right. 
but your son Jesse in particular fell in love with a man who killed his grandfather. Tell us about that and how these two men got to come to the United States. Boys, if I can give the real short version. Um, after my dad was killed, my Aunt Rachel and Elizabeth Elliot, the widow of one of the men, went in to live with the Waodani. That's a neat story, but that's told in books, so I, I won't go into that. But um, Betty stayed there for a couple of years and then came back to the States, and Aunt Rachel stayed there until she died in 1994 of cancer. I flew down from the States to represent the families and to bury Aunt Rachel. And uh, after I did then the Waodani, the old people like Minkai, who had taught me how to hunt and fish when I lived out there with Aunt Rachel when I was growing up, they came to me and they said, now we've decided that you'll come live with us. And I really didn't want to. I had a business, two kids in uh, finishing high school, and Jenny and I had two in college, and it just didn't seem practical. I didn't have any idea what I could do, but they said that they had decided that that's what we'd do. So finally, we ended up um, going down there to live with them. And uh, when we got out there, Jesse, our son Jesse, who was a junior in high school, I mean, he just fell in love with Minkai, Yeti, Tereu. They were just always horsing around. You, you could hardly find them apart from each other. If Minkai was going hunting, he'd take Jesse. If Jesse was going to walk to some other village, he'd take Minkai. They were just as inseparable as a grandfather and a grandson can be. And I'm sure that it, it didn't dawn on either of them how ironic it was that, you know, the, the man that became Jesse's surrogate grandfather was the man that had killed his grandfather. In fact, when Jesse was graduating from high school the next year back in the, here in the States, he asked me if for a graduation present if I would bring grandfather up to see him graduate. Well, I knew that that was highly unlikely to get all of his papers because he had never served in the military, didn't have citizenship papers, had no passport, and they needed a U.S. visa as well. But one of those unusual things, um, God pulled a class B or A minus miracle and we got all the papers and he came up. And then I had some speaking engagements, so I just asked Tementa and Minkai, um, because they both, they both came because Tementa has been designated by the tribe to learn how to fly. The first man who ever flew in an airplane from the tribe was with my father. dad, now the, the elders have told him that he should learn how to fly so that he can help them take God's word to the rest of their people. And they've told me to teach him. But t t take just a minute and tell about that in Quito. I think that's a thrilling story and will build the faith of our viewers. How uh, God worked it out so that there are citizens down there who've tried for years to come to the United States and never gotten a visa. There are a lot of countries like Ecuador where the economy is not real stable and a lot of people want to come to the States. So the uh, U.S. Uh, consul and the U.S. Embassy are real leery about letting people come unless they know that they'll go back. The things that they look for is people with bank accounts and cars and lots of family and a business or something down there. So they have a long questionnaire. Well, when I went to fill out that questionnaire for Minkai, you know, he didn't have any address because they don't deliver mail out in the jungles to us. No telephone number. He had no bank account. He didn't have assets down there. Um, no business for sure. In fact, of all those questions, the only thing that I could find that I could put anything down for was occupation. And I put hunter-gatherer because that's what they are. And uh, we were sitting there in the consular's um, sitting room with you know, just a, a ton of other people. And I was hearing stories of them saying how they'd been trying for five or six years and couldn't ever get it at any rate. Then I heard somebody say, hey, get a load of this. Now this is the consular officers saying, get a load of this, occupation, hunter, gather. And I thought, there's our opening. So I said, Dementan Minkai, let's go. We went up and it turned out that the consul had read a book about my dad's life when he was in the Peace Corps. And he said, he came when, over... When the man was, not your father. Your father wasn't in the Peace Corps, this man was. The, yeah, the, I'm sorry. The, the consul, the man who was now the consul had been in the Peace Corps and had read the book about my dad. And uh, he came over and he said, um, you know, I've, I read a book a long time ago and I've always wondered what happened to those people who killed the missionaries back in the 50s. And I said well, one of them is looking at you through the bulletproof glass. And he said, really? 
why would you want to take him to the States? And I said, well, my son, you know, calls him grandfather and wants him to come to his graduation. He said, but this is the man who killed his grandfather. And I said, yeah, but they're, they're as close as any grandfather and grandson can be. You know, God works in mysterious ways and um, Jesse really wanted him to come. So he said, I'll tell you what, if you can bring me his passport by 3 o'clock this afternoon, I'll give him a visa. And I said, well, we're not done with his papers yet. I mean, we had to get citizenship, military, voter exoneration, and then the passport. And um, we got all of that in less than five hours, went back there, and he gave us a one-time visa for Minkai and for Tementa so that Tementa could come up and, um, and I could show him how to fly. Oh, listen, I, I, I want you to tell the story about being in Czechoslovakia. We, we began by talking about people killing one another and somehow people on the outside thinking they were living peacefully. Well, if you looked at Europe, they've been killing one another, the Kosovars, the, yeah. uh, the Serbs, the Croats, the Muslims. Tell us about your experience in Czechoslovakia. Let's see if we can tie this together with the Waurani. Um, the, the story about my dad's death with the other four fellows has, has gone all over the world. I don't know why God chose to use it that way. I don't know why it caught the public's attention, but it did. And there was a pastor in Czechoslovakia back when it was still, you know, behind the Iron Curtain who heard something about this on Christian radio, shortwave beamed from Ecuador on World Radio Missionary Fellowship, and he was so intrigued with the idea that the very people whose family were killed by the Waurani would go back in to try to take them the gospel that he called the lady, Mrs. Kladensky, who was doing the broadcast, and asked her for more information. So she went to my mom. My mom sent, I think, a handful of slides and a little bit of the story over. And uh, he took that for five years. He traveled by bicycle and motor scooter all over Czech and Slovak republics telling people that story. Well, then when the Iron Curtain fell, a bunch of people inundated uh, Mrs. Kladensky with requests to bring my mom and come over and tell the story. So I wanted to know what countries were like under communist rule, I mean, firsthand. So I just went with them. And we were in one meeting. I mean, people just came by the scores to hear this story. And it turned out a lot of them were non-believers who had nevertheless heard this story and wanted to know how do people forgive each other for stuff like this. Well, we were in this one service and they asked me if I would share a little bit. and. Uh, Gina Kladensky just asked me, she said, um, you know, you've lived with these people, tell us about that. And then she had heard that I'd been baptized by the Waurani. So she asked me to tell about that, and I did. And then after the service, a man who worked for uh, the Czechoslovakian government's uh, television station, the national television station, came up and he, he said, you know, she interpreted wrong. It sounded to the audience like you were saying that you were baptized by the Waurani. He said, you meant that, that you baptized the Waurani. And I said, no, I haven't baptized the Waurani. They baptized me. And he said, how could that be? How could it be that? And I said, well, I grew up under them. I looked up to them as my spiritual elders and Kimo and Dewey baptized me. And I said, in fact, they were two of the men that killed my dad. And he just said, this can't be. I mean, he just kept wanting to clarify this. And finally he said, is this really true? He said, you know what is going to tear our country apart is now that the communists have fallen, those of us who have suffered under them want nothing better than to kill all of them and to have our revenge. And he said, if we do that, it's going to destroy our whole country. So he said, would you come and, on, and tell the Czech Slovakian people that you and this man live together and you don't hate each other, that you and these men um, who killed your father actually are friends. And um, here we are with Minkai, and I think it's pretty obvious if you saw us together, we, we don't just put this on, but he hunts for us and we hunt together and have lived together down in the jungles. And now he's traveling here in the States with me because people have asked, me to bring them to tell their story. Uh, why don't you take just a couple of minutes and tell us about your dream with iTech? Well, boys, when they asked me to go down and live with them, they didn't ask me to come down as a missionary. They wanted me to come down as part of the tribe. Now, I'm obviously not Waurani, 
but my father and now my mother, my aunt, but they call her my mother, are buried there. So that gives me standing down there, and I'm also an Ecuadorian citizen, so I belong in Ecuador, and now I belong in wild territory. And they had known me since I was a little boy, so they asked me to come, not to preach, teach the Bible to them. They can do that. What they wanted me to do was to help them learn to do things like medical work and dental work and to fly an airplane and fix things so that they could take the gospel that has changed their lives to the rest of their uh, tribe. They live scattered out over 8,000 square miles, so transportation is a big deal, uh, communications. And so I started uh, helping them. And then when uh, people in other tribes, believers in other tribes, started hearing that they were doing their own medical dental work, that they actually had a tiny little radio station, uh, a pharmacy, their own school and stuff, and especially when they heard they were building their own airplane, then those people started coming to me saying, is this true? Well, if they can do it, why can't we do it? And my answer to them was, well, you can do it. And then they would say, will you help us? And I said, no, I can't. You know, I'm, I'm busy helping them. And then the Waurani heard it. I think it was Tementa, really, that put the finger on me. He said, Babe, it's not only we who need to tell our people how to walk God's trail, but these people need to know, too. They need to teach their own people. And I said, but, but I'm busy all the time. You're always telling me, do this, do this, and uh, I'm busy. And they said, Babe, we say not just by yourself, but we helping you. Let's teach all of them so they can teach their people how to walk God's trail. And so we decided we needed a training center, and so we started the Indigenous Peoples Technology and Education Center, which is the acronym we use is ITEC, I-T-E-C. And that's located in Ocala, Florida. That's where our main training center is. And now they are working with some, uh, with some Ecuadorian believers who live just on the edge of the jungles to build a training center there for the various tribes. We're teaching the main students how to do these things, and then they're going back and they're going to build their own training center there on the edge of the jungle so that the uh, believers in the tribes can come and can learn to do these things, not as an end in themselves in itself, but as a means to sharing God's Word with their own people. Now, I want you to explain the term God's trail, and then I'm going to ask Tementa, or you ask Tementa, to look someone in the eye and invite them to follow God's trail. Okay. The, uh, when the Waurani lived, you know, killing back and forth, a lot of times families were separated by killing. Somebody would be out hunting or a group would be out hunting and a spearing raid would send the other people fleeing into the jungles. And to find each other, the people learned to make marks, to mark their trail in such a way that only their people could find it. Well, when Aunt Rachel came in and she had, you know, she had these markings on this paper, something never seen before, um, she could go in and she could read this and tell the people how to follow God's trail. And so they called this God's markings or God's carvings, just like they left their markings on a tree. And the connotation was if you wanted to find your family, um, you had to follow their trail wherever they had gone. And by following their trail, you would come to where they were. Well, in the same way, if we follow God's trail by, by reading His markings and doing what it says and going where He tells us to go, then finally we end up in God's place, which they call Onati and we call heaven. Now, you have Tementa invite somebody to follow God's trail. Oh, Tementa, Wabano Bota Inyanamai, Akano, Akano, Inyumo Video, Aka, O Bito, Kino Ponemi. Ekano ekano wengu itaro goramai, obito kino ponimi. Tomenga wa wengu itaro goka, obito invita kavi inyumo, um, inyumo, bito tribi boto ingles de devo. Boto mama yamo. Inyumo, inyumo. Boto tome minito minita yamo, minito wengu ito, wengu itaro goramai. Bito Iriki Ben Gobi Bito Ayate Kakawakimi Gibe Git. He said, If you people don't decide not to walk God's trail, if you see God's trail and you decide not to follow it, then he said, 
if you go off on a different trail, well then for now it may seem good, but later on then you're going to see that you won't come to God's place. And then living separated with God after you die, you're going to go to a place where you'll never see God. I can boto wingung in me go kimo ante minito wingung in mo inginti minito a penny giti ati minito wingung in you among a way you move good up any mini minito wingung on the walk minito wake up on tea mimo menungati ito the weapon minito wa giving mini. He said, but if you see it well, if you see God's trail well, and you decide to follow that trail, he says then God's carving says that first you should go into the water, be baptized, so that people will know that you're going to follow God's trail. And then he said, then following God's trail, it isn't always easy because there's other trails that sometimes we want to follow. But God sends his Holy Spirit and his Holy Spirit comes and does something for us that we can't do. He washes our hearts till they're clean Watamo, like the sky when it has no clouds in it. It's that clean and then seeing clearly in our hearts we can follow God's trail. And then he said, and then following God's trail we need to tell other people who don't follow God's trail, look, this is the good trail, come and walk this trail with us so that we can live in God's place together. Amen. God bless. Thank Wat you very much.